I'm just going to say a couple of words before handing over to Elena Basteri. Uh, this is a iteration of In Weaving Shared Soil, a project by Luisa Prado in the frame of the project Somatic Charting, which is a, a collaboration curated by Elena Basteri, as well as Lorenzo Sandoval and myself as part of TIER. And uh, Luisa's project began already in the summer and now in the winter it has moved indoors. And this is the second in a series of conversations um, around different questions related to plants and the body, inspired by writers and poets such as Gloria Andalzua, Lorna Good Goodison, and Laylee Long Soldier. So uh, today, Louise is going to be speaking with Milena Bonilla. Particularly, they, they're going to be touching on the botanical work of Rosa Luxemburg from her years in prison, and specifically thinking about the medicinal capacities uh, of these uh, plants that she was studying in connection with mental health. So I will turn over to uh, turn over the mic to Elena Bastieri. Maybe you would like to say something about the project before we hand yeah. over to Lisa. Hello, good evening also from my side. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Yes, uh, as you said, uh, uh, the, this um, conversation of tonight is uh, in the frame of a project called Somatic Charting, the House is the Body. Luisa is one of the artists participating in it. Uh, it is a project that will take place, well, it was supposed to take place uh, this year, but as many other things and projects has been postponed uh, to next year. And um, this conversation serves as a sort of uh, anticipation or overture, we could say, to the project um, that will happen between February and June next year. And we'll bring to, it will happen at TIA, the Institute for Endotic Research, and at Tanzhalle Wiesenburg in uh, berlin Wedding. And it will be, we bring together uh, uh, several visual artists and choreographers, um, performing artists and other pra body practitioners around the topic, the expanding notion of somatic as approaches that look at the body from within. Uh, looking, for example, at uh, organs, tissue, cells, uh, bones as triggers for transformation, for healing processes, for uh, generator of movements for the, in the field of dance in particular, and as trigger also like um, for new way of coming into contact with each other and into relation with each other. We'll have it through different um, approaches, as I said, and uh, yeah, Luisa is our uh, artist in residence because, she, because she's starting now and she will follow the project until the very end with different contributions, um, with this very precious approach, like looking at the words of plants and how they relate to our body and the internet connection <coughs> between the human body and, and the plants in a very broad sense. Uh, yes, I'm um, really looking forward to the conversation and uh, with uh, Milena and uh, Luisa. And I think now I'll just give you the word. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. It's been, as you said, it's been um, a very challenging year, I guess, in, you know, for, for developing a project like that, a project that was originally based on the idea of getting together and gathering and um, and having these exchanges right and of course that's um, that's affected the way that i've conceived this work this installation which is uh still ongoing um so maybe i'll start giving kind of a short description of the original idea for those who who are not familiar with it. So initially this installation was meant to be um, a garden developed in sites here. And the, the general idea for this, it was gonna start in the spring of this year. Obviously the spring <laughs> didn't really happen <laughs> quite like we expected there was a 
a little virus going around and because of this um the project had to be changed quite a few times throughout this year um we attempted or we started um with the idea of maybe taking the garden outside during the summer and i did uh, managed to start planting, um, start growing a few plants in the courtyard of the building where Tyr is located. But that, of course, brings its own challenges, right? Um, it's an open space that is kind of a communal space in the building. Um, I'm still wondering if it was a dog or a child who destroyed the the um, some of the plants. Um, but there are some rose bushes growing quite healthily there too still but then you know in the summer our hope was to start having some events in that garden but of course with the uncertainty related to to the pandemic we never really managed to hold any any events there in the summer um so as the temperature started dropping we decided okay let's take this garden inside again and then we were hit with you know more lockdowns more restrictions and so on so it's you know this project has shifted um i guess space and and even you know the very plants that i initially had or wanted to um to relate to and to have present in in this work since the beginning because of course plants that live inside don't really grow outside in um in here in europe right and um, and vice versa plants that uh, there are some plants that need the space and the environment to grow outside and then they they don't really work inside so because of this it's kind of changed <laughs> the shape of the project quite a few times but i think you know even in spite of this it's been a very interesting process um of course and i think today i i'm probably going to stir the conversation a little bit more towards topics that milena is is dealing with and that i think also speak to the very i guess history of this project the very um way that this project has um taken shape this year and what i mean by this is you know, I started thinking, obviously, um, a lot about how uh, how to relate to these plants. What plants do I? What plants can I um, can I bring into this work? Initially, my my idea was to, in the very very first iteration of the project, the one that was meant to start in the spring. I was thinking about um, ideas of belonging and uh, and I was starting to research plants that were symbols of uh, of countries, of nations, of groups, and so on and so forth. And that was kind of the, the first idea that we had. But then, you know, I, I was planning to do this inside and then we had to move outside. And then I, I thought maybe, you know, um an idea that has a relationship to that is also thinking about plants related to um which are often flowers uh flowers related to revolutionary movements and that's why in the backyard in the courtyard of um of the tier building um i planted you know red roses white roses which are now actually changing color i noticed that they're getting pinker um maybe it's the temperature i have to to figure out exactly why are they changing maybe it's the soil composition um but white roses um red roses which are of course a, kind of an international symbol of of um several socialist organizations um the white rose uh in a nod to the white rose movement uh, an anti-fascist movement um that uh emerged in Germany during the Nazi era. Uh, I guess the most famous members are the uh, Scholl siblings who were executed by the party in Munich. Um, and uh, then also um, carnations, which were <laughs> mysteriously destroyed. 
um, and uh, so that was taking place. And of course, you know, plants take time too. That's uh, another part that needs um, understanding, I guess, in a project that is dealing ultimately with other living beings, right? The time that we operate on is not necessarily the same time that plants operate on. So it's also, I guess, um, an interesting learning experience to to have to deal with that. And that's, you know, something that that I've been learning in, in my work throughout the past couple of years when I really started focusing my work on plants. Um, plants are very wise teachers and uh, in the ways that they um, make you or um, incite you to become aware of space and time and rhythm and so on. Um, so yes, and now we're going again back in and because of the lockdown and because it's winter, it's really not the best time to be growing uh, plants right now. Um, we started, you know, regardless of all these kind of uncertainties, we started um, this series of conversations. Um, in the first one, I talked to Pachi Sayuri, um, a Brazilian artist who um, in, in that conversation, we focused a bit on ideas uh, that actually relate to even the first um, iteration of the project, the first idea that I had for in moving shared soil, um, which is we had a conversation very focused on belonging and nativeness and what does that mean and the, the movement of botanic material across the world. Um, Sayuri's family is Japanese and she's been developing a practice related to um, a Japanese type of indigo that her grandparents brought over from um, from Japan. So it's it was a super interesting conversation in that sense. And today um, I mentioned that I was I've been thinking about um, the the conversation that we had and about your work, Milena. And, and thinking about how important it's been for me, but I know for, for many people too, having plants as companions and understanding in this moment of isolation and this moment of pandemic and lockdown, um, that it is possible to develop close and, and very beautiful relationships with other beings. And I guess, um, it's it's almost become a meme, right? It's become kind of a running joke that everybody's a plant parent now. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of one of those jokes that goes around the internet, but I do think that it is um it is something very relevant and it is something that has um I think made or or um incited people to to think of these relationships in a different way. And that's, um, I mentioned that I was thinking about that because your work, uh, you have developed a super interesting work around uh, Rosa Luxemburg's relationship with plants, particularly when she was imprisoned. So I wanted to ask you to um, talk a little bit about this work which we're developing here at ZKM, right? Um, as part of your residency. And yeah, I think it would be wonderful to hear a little bit more about that. Okay, hello to everyone. Um, thank you uh, to Tier and to Elena and to Luisa for the invitation. It's great because by the way, it took me back to Luxembourg. I have been like the whole past month just dealing with another political historical thing which are is connected with rosa uh which is the paris commune so it's, it's great to go perhaps forward in history so we can actually go back and forward and maybe we can kind of uh play with it a bit uh during the conversation um yeah the the actual uh interest of the herbaria uh came almost as a surprise i mean i was I had been trying to 
to understand the history of the left for the last 10 years in connection with my own experience in Colombia. And I think the best place to do it, I mean, maybe this is one of the excuses that I put myself to be in Europe, is to understand it from the like foundations of what got spread and transformed actually in Latin America. Uh, the misunderstandings of different movements, the misunderstandings of, of certain legacies. And in one of those uh, misunderstandings of, or new discoveries now that actually academia is doing towards uh, the left is the connection with nature. Uh, I have been always uh, thinking about a, a political ecology in, the con in connection with the left, also because uh, Colombia is a particular uh, strong um, biodiversity that for years has been facing extractivism and this is when Rosa Luxemburg enters. Uh, Luxemburg developed a body of work around the notion of imperialism connected to extractivism in the global south that is compiled this model in her most important work, which is the accumulation of capital with, from 1913. So even though that work is, I mean, is, 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 it can become like tiring, you know, to go through it, it has uh, certain points which actually are misunderstandings because certain works of Marx were not published by the time. So it's a lot of, you know, like back and forth uh, historical revisionism around how that work. But the main point that she makes is the, the, the destruction of natural resources uh, by capital expansionism in other territories, especially in the South or in the colonies by that time, that's how she will call it, cannot, it, it goes hand by hand with the destruction of uh, culture that sustains and understand this, how, how the dynamics of the biodiversity in connection with the people uh, operate. So that is something that when you read it theoretically, uh, okay, it comes like, you know, it comes like theory, you can understand it conceptually, it's interesting. Now, when I tap into the herbaria together with the letters, then the whole narrative and the whole idea of how operates, how this woman operated, changed in my in my mind but also in my heart and uh, uh, I felt that I kind of arrived late into the, the train but uh, in any case the care for me the most important part is the the care and the the way in which she perceived nature uh, for her closest friends the way she expresses her connection with nature in connection with her politics to her most uh, close circle was not that she was kind of slipping through the political writings, but it's clearly uh, fundamental for understanding her legacy. So uh, the exercise with the herbarium was very interesting because I was actually looking for it. And by looking for it, like looking where, like where the original archive is and all this story, uh, I end up bumping into the history of her murder, which is connected in a very strange way with the herbarium, because the herbarium was uh, somehow came to light in Germany in 2008 and 9 by the rediscovery of it. I mean, it was already known that was there, but not uh, popularized. And this rediscovery was done by a forensic doctor that claimed that uh, her body was never interred, that the, her body was still in the charity hospital in Berlin, and that was in 2008. So that story I will not touch upon about her murder. I'm, I'm also working with that, but it's too much of, I mean, it's a whole like, it's almost like science fiction. It's, it's really, it's really dramatic and it's really strong. So I try to not go into that because otherwise the, I drift the direction somewhere else. So by looking for traces of her DNA, he found the herbarium in a, in a, in a, in a archive in Warsaw, in the Act with, uh, Act with Norwich archive. And uh, yeah, so then during that time, actually, uh, Rax Media Collective was doing an essay on her and they kind of interviewed him. It was, they made a very long essay about like the, the connection between everything, but then the whole thing became silent again. And I discovered a photographic version of that herbarium at the same time in the Institute of Social History here. 
Apparently, both the herbarium and the photos uh, were kept during a, um, during a time by a socialist uh, from Austria called Joseph Buttinger. Joseph Buttinger gives the photos of the herbariums that are ectachroms to the Institute of Social History in the in 76, in, in, in 1976. And as I didn't have access to the archives in the Poland because they were not responding my emails, it was really difficult to get into them. I tried to work with the files of the photos that were in the archive. I knew that there was a publication made, which is this one. You know, I, I guess maybe a lot of you, I don't know if you know it, but this is this was published in Berlin uh, recently. But uh, unhappily, the quality of the of the prints, uh, imagine this visual artist kind of, we have very sharp eye. They were not made directly from the herbarium, but from uh, from another print. So I, I really wanted to see a better quality of the thing. And there was a very interesting surprise when I found the herbarium uh, uh, photos in the Institute of Social History because the ectachromes, I don't know, but I, some of you might know this, this situation that ectachromes were developed and when they were stored, if the, if the temperature was well kept, they will fade away in darkness. So that 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 problem becomes of that of that specific um, uh, set of, uh, of photographic development or technology was called dark fading. So uh, this problem pervaded all the museums in the world, the Metropolitan, the Getty archives that were everywhere. They had the same problem. So the institute also had the problem. So when I got the images, the images were. On top of the original images had been losing the chlorophyll because of the collecting, the photographs lost also the color. So that was the first step. I did a, I did a set of um, slides that were called dark fading chlorophyll. Because on the other hand, in the in the in the in the letters. There is one specific emphasis that she does all the time when she's writing from prison. And is, uh, she has a, 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 almost a trope, you know, like an obsession with color, with the light of the sun, with darkness. So she, there is a whole spectrum in which she's talking about the movement of, of clouds in which the, sun of the, the light of the sun penetrates, the space where she is the cause of the flowers, how everything is kind of pervaded with color. And as you can imagine, being in prison and making these highlights for me was quite an interesting contrast for her survival, let's say. Now that Luisa was mentioning also like how when we are in this lockdown, which is a very kind of faint, uh, easygoing, you know, contemporary version of being like, you know, it's not a prison, but it might make a lot of psychological changes in our interpretation and uh, representations also of the world. In the case of her, well, well, it was quite radical. And I was interested in the contrast between these, these slides that were fading and the sentences that she used during, uh, during all, the way, all the moments she was sending this, this correspondence to her friends. So, for example, in one of those letters, there is a sentence it's quite beautiful when she's describing a prison, you know, like these ones that uh, refract the light that she had in her in her in one cabinet, and she's describing exactly how she pulled the prism against the light and how all the ra the rainbow colors of the sun start to penetrate the space as a way to say, hey, I can transform my space just by putting the prism here. So when you have this kind of, I start to make a play like between the 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 the, the colorless pictures that were almost all all of them most uh, mostly fading to red, with the sentences. So you have this. This is one of the first pieces that I developed. But by that moment, at the same time, I was working with the help of a friend that became me, my collaborator. In that moment, she helped me to do research of what type of plants she collected during the during the, the prison years. And uh, we found uh, 22 or 23 of them that actually I was interested in what was the quality or how they their intelligence kind of helped 
uh, can help like uh, mental mental illness or you know nervous breakdowns why did i make this uh, connection i mean rosa luxemburg never did it openly but it was very clear even by interviewing the director of, of the rosa luxemburg stiftung came very clear that she it was an act of survival to collect this herbarium it was a it was an act of resistance it was an act of political engagement and it was an act of survival so when when i was thinking hey what if she will have the knowledge that was lost with uh, with this idea of the illustration illuminism the division of science and philosophy etc cetera, etc cetera. So the knowledge that actually was inherited by women herbalists as silvia Federici mentions in the caliban and the witch from from the heretics that knowledge was in that moment it wasn't you know like she didn't have access to this so for me in a way of honor honor the collecting of the plants by her and her friends uh, i decided to compile this list and see how they operate in our um as healers let's say right um so i made uh, i collect uh, the samples of their seeds because as you mentioned uh, working in winter with plants is difficult and a lot of the plants that i that, that we um recognized as like healing or helping with mental processes in terms of like depression or anxiety etc cetera, etc cetera, were not were um seasonal so they wouldn't wouldn't be available in the market by winter that was actually the moment in which i showed this project so what I did was some, a set of mappings with the seeds, so people could see the seeds, like they could take them away with them. But each collection of seeds will have a statement that I do of the political action that actually that seed will do in connection with the plant power, right? So uh, if you have questions, please interrupt because otherwise I feel like super monologic. <laughs> but uh, so their my approach was being very inspired by the way that uh, Luxembourg uh, de-anthropologizes her connection with nature. I mean, she tries to make an effort to even saying that she will, uh, she will uh, respect, uh, she respects this at the in the same way a worker, a bird, and a plant she has made several statements about feeling that she doesn't even belong to the human realm because she can understand why humans don't respect nature you know so this is one of the most striking ways of seeing uh you know a socialist that normally you see it with the dust of history putting them in a monument and this kind of like just this kind of tough or badass woman that wouldn't just like come down to earth and connect with other creatures, right? So in that sense, that tenderness of her thought, I felt that was actually the foundation of her struggle towards identifying the worker and her and his in inner intelligence and knowledge with his own capacity of revolting and emancipation. So I don't know, I have I made a map. I mean this is not the actual map, but this is just a sample we did for the exhibition because the map was more like the installation. So I have here the list of the 22, and I can maybe select a couple of them and read what I wrote, and then explain you more or less what, how did I end up writing what I wrote. So I, I, will, re I will read, uh, I mean, one that I find interesting because it's, it's yeah, it's, it's just the basic humble olive, you know, she collected some olive leaves during her years in prison. Was the was the uh, uh, at Setakau? Some no, of those, no, those, those the ones that I did at Setakau at 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 Setakau were more like uh, reappropriations of this method on plants that were planted there, but most of them were not in the collection of uh, Luxembourg, even though there were some coincidences. So there was a, trans a transition between the installation I did in Setakau, in which actually the plants appeared like protesting especially trees with like huge placards in which they were saying, I don't know, I will survive. You know, like there was a retreat that I was almost dying and then I wrote in German, I will survive. Or there was um, a dandelion 
uh, like lots of dandelions around and and i will write something about the way in which the seed spreads so but mm -hmm. these ones that are here are specifically a uh, part of the herbarium so uh, my favorite okay i will start with the olive which i think is a bit like it has a, an interesting uh saying for this specific moment uh, so i write laziness is a right olives take their time to grow curled robust slow things are beautiful so it's funny that okay so i write this because i see when you see what how uh, olive trees grow they really take time and when you see like they are here like some in uh, nearby the synagogue here in amsterdam like olive trees that are like 800 years old and it's just see like the the wrinkles become something you can really admire it's something that actually is telling you about knowledge is telling you about patience is telling you about different kind of things but also I selected because uh, when I was researching what are the, 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 let's say, the essential help that these plants can provide, well, as you can imagine, they come from very old uh, traditions, like right? from Druid, actually, like very, very old kind of oral transmissions, but also they have been, I would call, I mean, it's a harsh word, but I, I don't have anything better to say, like kidnapped by certain outer ships. So for example, the back flowers are not, necessarily you know a discovery of this person they were just like transmitted without any authorship until somebody decided to put the name and sorry guys that my battery is dying so i have to pick up the the cable very sorry one sec well well i'm pick it up and um, i'm also thinking about um, the like, olive trees in particular so now so um hola hi yes you there yeah. okay yeah um I was saying that um olive trees are so interesting because they're so narrow and they're so like they grow in these weird shapes that yes. are, I don't know maybe maybe someone who who knows um more about olive trees can uh, can correct me but i feel that they have growing patterns that are kind of difficult to predict yeah i don't know i don't know that much about that but at least i know that maybe you could even read some some history in them for yeah. sure oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh i i i i i was checking into the plants um let's say intelligence or transmission of information in the in the sense of healing and uh for example olive is important for uh relieving uh exhaustion fatigue you know when somebody is fatigated when somebody is extremely tired and that's how it came with the idea of laziness because in this moment i mean like i i think I don't want to be too positive about the virus because that 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 is it's just nonsense. I mean, it is, it's like everyone has been suffering a lot from it. But at least the the planet, the entire planet, slowed down in a way. Even though uh, maybe it will be very short for it to recover. What I feel is that to put everything in a stand of suspense allows us to recognize uh, patterns of thinking, patterns of behavior, patterns of how we connect with other beings. So that's why I brought this sentence as, as the first, because I, I think it's, it's interesting to see, for example, the timing, as Lisa was commenting at the beginning, when you see the timing of a plant that lasts 800 years and grows and curls and becomes like this kind of wrinkled, strange being that actually you might think that even is the avatar of another being. And then you see our lifespan of extremely hurry consumption and nonstop there is something that is not in balance. I mean, that's what, for example, Rosa will say, talking about uh, something else. And I will get uh, my favorite one. This is really my favorite one. Is the second. I will only give these two because I would like to continue the conversation with Lisa. And it's uh, Hembane. It's a flowering pine uh, plant. His na her name in uh, Latin, which is a colonial name, of course, is Iosiamus niger. And it's native uh, from uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, and the Mediterranean, sorry. 
and uh, it has one particular alkaloid that shares with one of, of the most important sacred plants in Latin America, which is Brugmasia. They, they, they share a flower that has a shape of a trumpet. They, in, in fact, the Brugmasia flower uh, is called, in, uh, at least in the Netherlands and in English, a trump, trump, uh, trumpet angel. So it's almost, they are considered in tradition, in different traditional cultures as uh, messengers, as a lot of other narcotic plants, right? So Hembane shares scopolamine with Brugmasia. And scopolamine has been used as anesthetic, but also has been used, as you know, to commit crimes. You know, like uh, robbers in Latin America use it uh, to, to make people dorm and do whatever yeah, they want a, with them. That's a floripondio, no? Sí, floripondio. And also the datura is also like going in the, into the same, like at least it has the same um, alkaloid. So as uh, Hembane, I found out that actually was used as a template plant in uh, some druid rituals. So the plant is so powerful that it actually becomes like a sort of template for other plants to interact that do their magic, let's say, right? And in that sense, the plant has the power to stop time and or accelerate it. It's a plant that you can use to travel in time. Uh, of course, Rosa Luxemburg will never co come to this conclusion with this plant, but I thought in this moment, uh, the separation between uh, traditional knowledge that had been wiped out by an epistemolo epistemological colonization need to come to the front because our epistemology in the West is becoming extremely tired and insufficient to understand how to represent the world and we are just killing it. So I will read in vain and then I stop. When the mind goes faster than the body, a witch is needed. Finances pretend to be the mind of the world. Sometimes the world seems to be predictable, but it is not. Tackling convulsive threats of excessive consumption, extractivism and megalomania. Spread their seeds around Black Fridays or similar. Stock markets need to get well poisoned in order to change their pattern of destruction. Fly low. So basically I invoked, I made an invocation of the Hembane power and the scopolamine power to help to slow down again. You know, it's important to slow down. And then the virus came, but you know, I didn't invoke the virus, so don't blame it on me. Um, but I, it's, it's, I think it was already in, I mean, I don't think this is made by, you know, like, Normal and I do work, I don't think it's made by me. You know, like it's, it's, it's I, I even sometimes it's terrible to put a sort of authorship. I think this was actually something that I felt it was directed by the herbarium and by her, by, by the accumulation of capital together. And in that note, yes, I, I don't know. I, I will, I would like, I would love to, to know what you think, guys, and Risa, especially, because I don't think I, I shared with her this information before. Yeah, no, this is this is amazing. I, I was thinking, I I have like a few a few things that I'm curious about. Um, so, do you know how she collected these plants as she was in prison, and and what kind of samples did she take? What kind of what? What kind of samples? Was it more like leaves or? What yeah, kind of uh, the, she was, as you can imagine, an amateur uh, collector. Even though she did the studies in botany uh, before studying economy and philosophy in Zurich, she was collecting, uh, she was very interested in botany and geology and ornithology. She was like uh, the hugest, the hugest fan of birds I have ever seen. It's insane. Um, so, uh, when she was free, she will roam around the botanical gardens and she will go to the Alps and then she will get a more kind of per, like proper way of, like she was more careful, let's say. You can even see it in the publication, you know, she was writing more notes. She was way more attentive. Uh, then within the period of imprisoning, she was in three different prisons. Um, I have to say that she went to prison in the first moment because she was totally opposing to the First World War. And when she was released, the First World War was uh, coming to an end. 
and she was killed during another during the German uh, attempted revolution that fell. And uh, because she was uh, again like she was very vocal against the war as a capitalist machinery that was still oppressing the workers, making it making them soldiers. So the coming back to the herbarium, the way in, 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 in which she was collecting from prison to prison changed because in the first prison she was, that was in Barnimstrasse in Berlin, uh, which now is a playground, ironically, interestingly. Mm -hmm. I'm, making a film, I'm making a film there. <laughs> uh, she had a garden. She had an access to the gardens. So she will see, and she writes an amazing, beautiful letter about a chrysanthemum that was flowering. And I was like, oh my God, this woman was like on LSD. It was insane. And uh, so she was very much in contact with, with the plants. She was seeing insects. She was kind of like greeting the birds. She even was talking about the mice that will come into her room and eating her silk, whatever. You know, like she was kind of, and she was more vibrant because it was the first year. Then when she moved to the red to the to Blanc Fortress and to Breslau, then she started to diminish. I mean, like all historians are saying that when she entered the prison, her hair was like ours, like this. And when she came to prison, her hair was white. You know, so it was a very tough period for her. She was having problems with her stomach all the time, like emotional upheavals. So that's why uh, the, the uh, Jorn Sturmfrut from the from the Stiftung saying that, say, says and states all the time that this was like her therapy. That's what the way she could keep rational, like, and, and you know, like on earth. So as you can imagine, Luisa, uh, the, the more she spent time in the, in the, in the prison, uh, the less she was kind of being able to focus too much onto, onto this. So there are moments in which I actually, she never collected the roots, for example, and that's a mistake, you know, from the like professional point of view. And uh, some some uh, samples she will complement with drawing. So, for example, if she has like just uh, the flower like head, she will put a drawing of the branch and the and the and the and the couple of leaves. She was actually a very skillful um, drugged woman. You know, she 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 knows how to. She she was sending beautiful. There is a collection of sketches of her that are really stunning. Um, so it, very, it varies a lot. And some of them actually had notes on the person because when she was for in the last, uh, in Breslau, that was the last prison in Poland, she didn't have access to any green. So all the plants that she will collect were, were brought by the, by the friends or sent in bouquets. So she will extract she will use that. That was like human contact anyway. She wouldn't be able to collect, but she will use that and okay, and then put them in the in the in the herbarium. That's how she that's how she did. Now there is a very interesting uh, proposition made by um, a Polish wait a Polish scholar called uh, Dorota Sajewska in which Dorota Sajewska developed her PhD around the notion of necroperformance, uh, but very much based in Poland. So she takes all the case of Rosa Luxemburg to talk about necroperformance and theater. And uh, she, she, uh, was, oh, she was kind of uh, developing a whole research on how the herbarium was connected with her political work. And she discovered through another author that this author was stating that actually she was trying to for the herbaria to become a code which i think is striking you know so the way in which um, i mean this this person is uh i will i will give you now the note of his um of his name because i don't want to leave it just like that heinz knobloch was uh is a researcher that made a book called Meine Liebste Matilde, My Little Matilde, which is Matilde, uh, Matilde Jacob was the, one of the best friends and uh, secretary of Rosa Luxemburg. 
So he, in this book, developed the idea because Matilde Jacob had to collect all the items of Rosa Luxemburg after she was disappeared, basically, for six months. Um, in the in the canals in the Lauder Canal in Berlin, she was collecting all her items. And this author is mentioning that actually, in among all the letters that some of them got lost after the Second World War, there was some indications that actually she was hinting certain things in between the herbarium and the bouquets that she was receiving. There was some communication, but that idea, at least from the point of view of Dorota, is not fully uh, um, developed. And of course, this is one task, a huge task that I still have to develop. But I think it's, it's amazing. Wow, wow. It's it's such a touching story, really. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, her figure is so emblematic as a symbol of the left, particularly in Germany. And, but not only, right? Like she mm. is, you know, she has become kind of an international symbol of the left. Absolutely. And in thinking about this aspect of her and her life gives such a dimension to, to that kind of idol that, that to me, it's, it's so human, you know? Absolutely, yeah. Being, being incarcerated and, and thinking about like the, the dehumanization of being incarcerated and and taking up this you know this or or continuing at least to to maintain some kind of relationship with other beings through this collection through this herbarium i don't know there's something that to me is so touching about this and so tender yes absolutely i mean in confrontation with what i i have seen on her in terms of how she writes how she resists and that when I got, start to get depressed here in my house by feeling lonely or something, I'm like, what a sissy, Milena, shut up, you know? Go back to Rosa Luxemburg and read it a bit and then you just calm down, you know? Don't be such a sissy. And it's, it's what, what, on the other hand, I think like it's important to consider that suffering is something very relative. I mean, it's important to feel compassion. And, in, and this is something that actually I learned from her somehow, you know, like to remember that suffering is suffering no matter what. You know, like, of course, you might consider that, I don't know, privileged kids living in Berlin or in Amsterdam that had high dedicated or, you know, that that are in a level of suffering that less than other situations in which maybe people that is doing certain other activities are more threatened. But I think that somehow it's important to keep in account that this has been uh, challenging for the humanity. And in that sense, I think you develop a different perspective of everyone's uh, plight you know like i have been like uh, i don't know i have been like seeing friends that have lost family and that have uh, been sick for four months and other friends that are just freaking out by being alone you know like it's a totally different situation but at the same time it is i, I as, as rosa luxembourg was kind of considering a beetle being eaten by ants with such care i mean she writes a letter only talking about that beetle being being carried out by ants and being eaten up by, by ants as if it will be like at the biggest tragedy. I mean, she was very dramatic on the other side. But, you know, like when you start to see life with the eyes of care, uh, life changes. And uh, I hope that honestly, and based on her work, this is one of the, like to learn the tenderness of life and to learn to care of each other, friends and also colleagues and et cetera, et cetera, and extend it. It's important, and I, I feel I feel you, Luisa, when you when you see how 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 touching um, the whole story behind the curtain of representation of politics is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, that's something I cannot really shake, you know, because it's been. I guess it's. It touches me in particular because it's been a dimension that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, this kind of, I don't know, I almost feel like it is a form of time traveling, um, developing these these relationships, perhaps with you know people who are not even alive anymore, 
but it is a way, I guess, of forging a, a relationship with with these um, these beings that are not um, that are not living beings anymore, but they they have. Um, I don't know, like engaging with their legacy and engaging with what they have left in the world and and remembering them also, right? Because it is a, a question of memory too. It speaks to, yeah. to a question of memory. And I, I've been, I don't know, I've been thinking so much about how... Um, in, in Portuguese, we would say like incarnated. Does that make sense in English? Like someone who is not incarnated anymore, someone who is not alive anymore. But um, but thinking about people who are not, let's say, incarnated anymore, um, and engaging with, as I said, with their legacy, it is a way of keeping them with us, and mm -hmm. and. I don't know. Uh, I just feel. I, I just feel very. I, I am surprised. How, I mean, uh, how interestingly you move the subject because because one of the main. Uh, I I mean, like when you have a very long a very long process of understanding your own practice, I'm still trying to figure it out. You know, like I I say that it's about something, but then I'm like, really, you know, these kind of questions that you're all the time. My my research, uh, bring like has, is so, I'm um, like big not in the sense that's grandiose but in the sense that i i am interested in so many things that sometimes i get lost and you are like what the fuck i'm talking about what is my i don't i don't you know like that i had that crisis 10 years ago not anymore and when 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 you start to see that actually the things start to connect each other you know that you are building tissue not only about the works that you are developing but how the work how the work how that work communicate with the works of other people and especially with the legacy of dead people so what when at certain point i start to see why i'm so obsessed with history what i am so obsessed with these people that actually end up being like just memory and i think it has to do with this idea of marx of the cyclical tendencies of capital which actually he applies also to the cyclical tendencies of history and that's the notion of mater uh, historical materialism connected to class struggle and but beyond that part is like uh if I don't have the capacity to see from where and in which bodies all these ideas emerge and transform and, and were transported and also colonized other territories and became decolonized, interestingly, in Latin America with the very strong movements, which we have Paulo Freire in Brazil, for instance, you know, very particular, powerful people. How how it is that actually those memories can reify through the misinterpretation of the legacy, which actually was happened with Luxembourg by Stalin during the whole period of the, so of the Soviet Union and by capitalism itself. So, so for me, it's fundamental to understand that those gaps, because those gaps were the ones are the ones that are feeling with rage and violence, the extractivist policies that are wiping out the forest in Latin America. So there is no disconnection. Lauren? Sorry, Milena, did you say vitalism? No. Stalin and vitalism? No. Stalinism and capitalism. Ah, Stalinism, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I wasn't talking okay. about vitalism. No, that's another, that's another story. Um, but but by the way, Luisa, this thing that you were so kind of, uh, so kind of recalling the dead, um, in this moment, I think we are, there is a, uh, I feel that there is a side guys because I have been, basically the last three weeks, I have been dealing with that subject of what does it mean to be super conscious about living among dead people? Not because necessarily, they, maybe they are reincarnated already if you believe in reincarnation, which is actually, for example, my case. Being a Marxist also, I, I, am, I have also some Buddhist tendencies, um, you know? So mater historical materialism will stand in beyond the history of this particular dimension. Um, 
But in that sense, it's like, for example, what is happen happening with, with capital and palliative care, which is a discussion we had like some time ago with, uh, with another group of reading. What is happening between capitalism and the isolation that we are living, that is imposed and is, is an opportunistic trope of activism of consciousness somehow. So in that sense, she is super important to, to keep in account as, as a memory and as a legacy. So beautiful. Yeah. That's super, super beautiful. Yeah. I wanted to know if anyone else also wanted to ask a question or to. Yeah. A little bit more. Um, yeah, I wanted to. to uh, actually, I think it's quite interesting. Like uh, when you're talking about uh, in the Marxism, uh, like the cyclical nature of capitalism. Uh, like I was thinking also like right before you were talking about uh, that Milena, like in relation uh, with the tension of the notion of uh, individualism and collectivism. Uh, I mean, I don't know if this makes a lot of sense, uh, but at least for me, like when thinking about plants, I hardly think about individuals. I think also because the cyclic nature of plants, it's quite different uh, or it might be different. Uh, but there is like a feeling of um, always like being the same body who can survive. Also because I mean like the way like you can cultivate plants, it's literally a part of the same body that like you would actually expand. Yes. So so like in the descriptions of Rosa Luxemburg, actually uh, for what you are, I, I never read them, but for you explain, it seems like actually like she goes like to the detail of each uh, individual, each being being yes. an insect or a plant yes. or, or something yes. like that. And I was thinking like if you maybe uh, you have uh, so, some some comments on this idea of uh, like, like cyclic elements uh, mm -hmm. in relation with the tension between individualism and capitalism. In the in Rosa Luxemburg work? Yeah, well, in Rosa Luxemburg work maybe, but uh, like in your work. Ah, well, that's a whole uh, uh, issue. Because, well, I, I, I remember that like long time ago, I was uh, very much interested in the virus and the bacteria as, as tropes, actually. That was 2015 when I was I started the research on the Paris Commune in Paris. And I remember that I kept saying something to my friends. It's like, dude, we, are, we won't understand anarchism until we don't become bacteria. That's what I said all the time. We won't understand uh, anarchism if we don't become a virus because that those are anarchists, not us. You know, we are, we, are, we suck, you know, like. <laughs> so, of course, I mean, like the whole, the whole, when, when I turn, for example, to certain writings that the Luxembourg has been writing, one of the main oppositions, I mean, the main opposition that she had with the Bolsheviks had to do with the centralization of power under one leader that will kind of, you know, be the god of the people and then from there the instructions of how to um, achieve the social revolution and socialism will be which is the leninist model so lenin lenin and, and luxembourg had this fight over that because she was saying you are not considering the capability of the worker to reaffirm and i and his intelligence to organize and from that organization actually some leadership will uh, arrive, not the other way around, because for the for her the other way around was totally unnatural. You know, she has all this idea of a spontaneous uprising, which actually has been contested by some historians. But some, so, that's it. Sorry, I mean, uh, there are certain uh, branch of historians that actually said that there's some misunderstanding, but there are some of them that actually support her her this 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 uh, understanding of. Uh, spontaneity as a way of really make a revolution that will make sense, let's say, right? And that actually doesn't occur within an individualistic mind. It has to be hive mind, right? So in that sense, I think she was pretty clear. And the main, the main, uh, one of the main uh, struggle that she has being a revolutionary had to do with her pacifist stance against the, the bloodshed of uh, a group of people that actually she considers uh, had a need 
of a sort of luxurious life in the way that if you are a worker that being exploited and implemented as a soldier by capital, you won't have time to enjoy the beauty of life, which is nature, but not from this petit bourgeoisie point of view. For her, it was important that everyone would realize as her how cruel nature is and how beautiful in the way which is cruel are the lessons that we have to learn from it. So in that sense, she had this kind of double face towards, towards nature, and it sounds a bit like a cliche, but you could see through her letters and through her, her understanding, for example, of uh, weather or even climate change. She was talking about climate change by that time, not in the way that we are understanding it now. But for example, I had um, somewhere a letter in which, let me check if I have it, I might have it at hand because I wanted to highlight it today because we were talking about um, uh, these uh, poets that are also are from the border between Mexico and the United States. And he's talking about, about Navajo, I think it's Navajo Nation. There is a, a letter that she sends to Ma Matilde Jacob. I know, to, so, to, so, to Sonia Lee. So to, she sent this letter from Ronke, the 2nd of May of 1917, to Sonia Livneck, which is the wife of Karl Livneck, that is the uh, socialist leader that was killed with her the same day, the 15th of April of uh, 1919. And the letter, uh, the paragraph that I wanted to highlight says, what am I reading? For the most part, natural science, geography of plants and animals. Only yesterday I read why the warblers, which are birds, are disappearing from Germany. Increasingly systematic forestry, gardening and agriculture are step by step destroying all natural nesting and breeding places. Hollow trees, fallow land, thickets of shrubs, white red leaves on the garden grounds. It pained me so when I read that. Not because of the song they sing for people, but rather it was the picture of the silent, irresistible extinction of these defenseless little creatures, which hurt me to the point where I had to cry. It reminded me of a Russian book, which I read while still in Zurich, a book by Professor Sieber, about the ravage of the redskins in North America. In exactly the same way, step by step, they had been pushed from their land by civilized men and abandoned to perish silently and cruelly. So here, just as a little um, remark to avoid suspicacies, uh, you can understand, I mean, like it is, it, there is not that she is a in, a, in a colonial, like putting in the same level uh, the redskins and animals, but she's actually leveling the anthropological difference. Because you can understand, if you understand the letter in, in, the, in the wider context of the work, it's very clear that this is what she's trying to do. And uh, when she's talking about natural environments, she wouldn't make a difference between the, the environment of the bird, the environment of the, of the redskins, and the environment of the actual worker. So war, for her, was one of the biggest machines to wipe out environments and cultures um that she could uh, ever imagine for and that's that's why in her ecological mind that's why she was opposing so uh strongly to it so i i i think that's also interesting in the way in which not about collectives of people but she was thinking in a wider scope uh from her knowledge in geography and, and botany i think it's is I, I i cannot think about her without this um other Elements. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Wow. Well, do, do you think that she was also a reader of uh, Kropotkin? Because, for example, like, like, um, did she, did she, did she read this one also? Like, maybe, like the. I haven't. Uh, I haven't, but I have to because Kropotkin was a, you know, Kropotkin was way too close to the commune, so we have yeah. been checking him. Yeah, mm -hmm. but. But the mutlet, I know the the the, princ the the principles, but I haven't really stepped on the on the book, which is a task I that I also yeah, have like now. Yeah. Actually. But but the, the thing like also like he was doing like all this analysis of uh actually it was a critique of to nerve that Darwinism. Like yeah. how at the time like they were using like this uh, justification of uh, natural science constructions 
uh, to prove like actually capitalism, it was the most natural system because look how the lions, they kill all the animals very freely. So human, we are the same. So it's funny to, to understand actually that there was an aspect of capitalism that actually it was trying to equalize like uh, the human nature to the, to the nature at large by solving through science, like how wild yeah. it was. Uh, but actually like, like with Kropotkin, like he was trying to like with his, his critique on neo-Darwinism, neo what yes. he was trying to do, it's pretty much the opposite. Like, so we like, oh no, but look at all these like, different beings, like how they organize themselves to help each other. And that's how like uh, evolution works, not the opposite. It's not yes. by, by violence, it's by yes. cooperation. And, and yes. therefore like the mutual aid. Do you think like uh, Rosa Luxemburg was like thinking in the same, in the mm. same way? Um. I don't think I don't have I mean I, I don't have enough literature to say so but at the same time I think is uh, she was very much committed to socialism but by the way was thinking very much socialism in the connection that it had with the Paris Commune and Kropotkin was thinking an anarchism connected also with the Paris Commune which is kind of when I kind of will put glue on them let's say um, but I don't uh, in her political writings, that this is the problem basically. That actually with Rosa, we, we will have to make a, it's not that we have to make a big, a big effort, but just a little to connect because it appears to be very separated in principle, even if not, the more like a private epistolary correspondence where she states these uh, concerns and a more, um, that, that, let's say that the, the theory or the more activist set of writings, even though I haven't read them all, you know, so I, I, I might be, uh, I might have a bias based on my like uh, reduced knowledge because I don't, I haven't read the whole over uh, of uh, Luxembourg. So, but that as far as I know, she never mentioned an approach to politics based necessarily on nature as Kropotkin. But what for me was very clear that she, 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 something she had very clear is that extractivism is nothing that you could solve within a closed environment for capital because capital behaves in an anarchist way. In like, if you consider anarchy from the more negative point of view, you know, because it has to expand all the time. It doesn't reduce itself to one to, to Europe. I mean. She was, I mean, and this is something that actually Marx at a certain point also had been pointing out. The thing is that she didn't have access to that material when she did a critic towards Marx in the, in the accumulation of capital. But uh, her thesis, her basic thesis uh, has to do with, it is impossible for uh, entire cultures and uh, environments to survive a uh, way of doing things that is extractivist that will come, it necessarily will have to stop the way in which, for example, Persians or Indians or Algerians will know how to make bridges because that colonialism, when you stop their knowledge of how to melt their bridges, they will have to buy your way of making their bridges. This she was stating. And of course, this has to do with, um, with about white wipe out of the environment, but no, she didn't go so detailed as as Kropotkin. I think they they in that sense, I think that needs at least from my side, uh, or maybe somebody else has been doing more research, because I I wouldn't dare to to put them like necessarily on the same page, even though they were both, as you as you know, political warriors, very respected and very loved. Yeah. Anyone else with, uh, with any questions? No one? Uh, so I was wondering, um, do you, would you like to say anything else, Milena, to uh, start slowly wrapping up? Uh, wait, that I have a little sign here. Uh, um, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. No, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I always enjoy talking about these things. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation. Well, maybe, maybe 
can, it would be possible like to uh, just uh, speak briefly about what you are planning in Berlin? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. Berlin became a labyrinth without end. I have to confess. Um, doing I mean, like I am doing, I start to do a long term research on the body that was hold during a period in the Charité Museum being suspected of being the body of Rosa Luxemburg. I mean, the story of the killing of Rosa Luxemburg is a whole subject by itself. So this uh, second body appeared, um, the, the body that was supposed to be Rosa Luxemburg's body that is supposed to be uh, interred in the, in the monument to the socialists uh, is gone. I mean, that body was taken away by the Nazis in 1935. So there is nobody interred there. So for me, it was very interesting that actually with this plot empty, then there was this doctor that did a claim that he had found a body that actually is, is, has a striking resemblances to Rosa Luxemburg body in 2008. And of course, all the political left start to get crazy about it and start to ask questions. And he was actually collaborating with the Stiftung for a while, then he ended up in, in trouble. Then the, another socialist uh, filmmaker made a book with the most knowledgeable expert on Luxembourg, Luxembourg by the time um, that uh, unfortunately died uh, two, two years ago to contest the theories of the forensic doctor. So the, the, the thing that I find super striking is that the a body that's anonymous, which is something that touch base in my own country, particularly that has to do with the amount of people that have been disappeared. You understand also this, Lorenzo, Luisa, I think all of us can connect with this uh, cruelty of the disappearance of bodies. So I, I, I it, it kind of hit some vein and I was like, how this anonymity of this body became for like a couple of years, the like abstract image of somebody whose body actually disappeared, but this also the emblematic body of a lot of fetishism around the left, right? So this body, this work is extremely delicate because it entails the possibility of restart a research on the, actually what happened that body uh, at the end, there was a huge dispute that ended up in, in court. And the body was, uh, he, the, the, the doctor was obliged to give the body to be interred. The director of uh, the Stiftung didn't want to disclose the place of interment, even though uh, we know where it is in, this, in which cemetery, there is not any kind of sign that is saying that any, and she was interred without even a plague saying this body is anonymous. And I find that not, I mean, the connection with Rosa Luxemburg and her struggles and the idea of what she was writing about her death, like how she wanted to be part of the earth, you know, like all these things. And then you have this anonymity that actually is interred with it anonymity is something I would love, uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, attempting to touch upon through a series of interviews. Uh, I already interviewed, I have like, like a record of the interview with the forensic uh, director of the Charité Hostel, that is the person that took the case and the director of the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation. But there are several people that have been involved in this case. And uh, I think it's, for me, it's important to recover uh, actually the memory of the anonymity rather so, so in that case, uh, Luxembourg became almost like, like an excuse to, to precisely honor what Lisa was pointing so sharply and so importantly. Uh, and is the, the ones that left us, we tend to forget them very quickly because, well, this is something, an, an idea that I'm starting to develop. Maybe there have been some other like, like scholars that have developed it already. But I think one of the cruelest things that capitalism has done is the reification of death. Because the accelerationism in which the things are, you know, like this idea that we only have one life is part of the whole um, upheaval that we are experiencing uh, ecologically. Because we, we don't even think anymore about legacy. What are we going to leave to the people that comes after? 
we have to consume everything now and this idea of individual is also playing a big role on that you know the idea that you think that everything that you had done that everything that you have achieved that everything that you consume that the money you have in your bank account is your oeuvre and it's not a collaboration between different bodies that put you in the place where you are i think that is one of the most uh, difficult things for us to surpass you know this 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 uh this idea so to reclaim um, possibility of uh, engagement with anonymity I think is important and I think uh, that will honor also somehow her memory and the memory of all the the people that have been killed for political reasons which I, in my opinion is <laughs> you know a victim of domestic violence is a victim of political misunderstandings so in that sense, I think uh, maybe, I don't know if uh, Luis, I would like to comment a bit more on that, because you have been also working in, in another arena with bodies and, and I don't know if dead, but I don't know, actually the contrary, not reproductive life. So, but I will, I will just stop here and be happy with having you around. No, I was just thinking about this question of engaging with the dead. Um, definitely a, quite a, a few questions in my work do come from an engagement with, with the legacy of the dead. Also that in my own family, um, my own grandmothers and their relationship with plants has been a big influence on um, their their knowledge of herbal medicine, which I didn't inherit, I didn't learn from them. Uh, my work in in many ways, I guess, is a way of, of um, recovering that or, or at least uh, developing my relationship with these these ancestors, you know, these, these, um, these women that came before me and that because of, and I think uh, maybe that, that also creates a, an interesting bridge, but the knowledge that I didn't inherit from them, uh, this you know knowledge about herbalist practices, that is also for a political reason. That is knowledge that's killed and and stifled for a political reason. Yeah. Both me and my mother, we grew up in different periods of the industrialization of Brazil, and that meant also a uh, um, uh, a penetration of the of uh, pharmaceutical industry in brazil and therefore a substitution particularly in um, in urban centers um or a push towards western medicine yeah. western models of medicine and knowledge and and so on so i grew up during one phase of that my mom grew up doing another phase of that so of course that um that affects how this knowledge is passed down or not, right? And so, of course, my my practice has, you know, even though I'm talking about reproduction and so on, my practice does have a lot of that. And as you were speaking, I was also thinking about um, Thomas Sankara, actually, mm -hmm. um, because in it is one of those weird coincidences but in i think it was like in a speech or something about like a week before he was murdered um he he said that well revolutionaries as individuals as people can be murdered you cannot kill ideas and thinking about you know all these i guess these these um I mean, let's let's call them ancestors. These ancestors mm -hmm. that we have invoked here today, Rosa Luxemburg, and uh, and um, that I'm also trying to invoke in my work. I think this is this is the the gist of it. You know, um, even the even though this knowledge that my my grandmother, my great grandmother possessed, I do not have it in quite the same way the idea is still there mm -hmm. and that's what lives on i think also in rosa's legacy yes i will i will have to i mean admiring your speech and being very connected with what you say i will have to say 
I, I trust we have it. And I think we have it in our, you know, in our construct by even biological construction, our like very core and DNA. It's just we have to find the, the the tools to to reach that, to tap into that again. And I think art is an amazing tool to go into that direction. And with this, I will just uh, give us a present, a sentence to to Luisa, based on, and I'm sure you know it because it came a Latin American uh, warrior, which is um, the priest Ernesto Cardenal when uh, Adolfo Baez was killed by the Somoza uh, regime in Nicaragua, wrote his epitaph. And the last uh, sentence says, they thought that they have interred you, but they didn't know that you were a seed. Yeah. And That's yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So we are all seeds, inheriting the information from our mothers. <laughs> yes. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Guys, it was amazing. Thank you so much for inv inviting me. It reinvigorated me. I was having a really hard, hardcore day, I have to confess. Oh my God, same. And then this conversation has brought me back to, to humanity and nice connections. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, Milena. Awesome. Thank you, Louisa. Thank, Thank you, Benjamin. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milena. Everybody. Thank you, Elena. Thank you all. Bye. Have a good evening. You sending kisses. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. Yeah. ciao. The recording would be eventually online also. Just to know. Ciao. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.